In this lecture, we're going to look at uh, how to handle multivariate data. So, so far we've been looking at examples where we have one feature, one x value, and then we're trying to uh, represent uh, some other, some target value as a function of that. So we have the x and the y values, and we uh, do, for example, some regression to predict the y values or to visualize some trends or things like that but often we have several features so we have multi-dimensional data uh, multi-dimensional inputs and we need uh, some way to understand uh, that data so one problem is visualizing data when we have more than two dimensions in total and also we're going to look at how to extend uh, regression to multivariate data so this is actually uh, quite simple to do uh, with the linear regression but then we're going to look at uh, um, how we can uh, uh, another way of trying to solve the um, uh, overfitting problem when we don't have uh, as much ease as we saw before in selecting different models so uh, what we did with say um, selecting different degrees of the polynomial and so on that may not be very practical when we have a large number of features and we don't know which to, to choose so we're going to look at regularization which is another approach to uh, mitigating overfitting and we'll see specifically the example of reach regression so the first problem when handling uh, uh, multivariate data is that we have lots of dimensions to examine so I'm going to uh, give an example with a, a simple data set that is uh, multidimensional. We have four features, but uh, it's still uh, low enough dimension that we can actually visualize the features and understand uh, the data easily. Next week, we're going to take a look at uh, dimensionality reduction, which uh, is helpful when we have a large number of features and things uh, become really complicated. But uh, this is a, a classical data set in, in machine learning and statistics, the IRIS data set, which is a data set of measurements of petal and sepal uh, dimensions for three different uh, species uh, of flowers. Uh, so these are images of the, the three different species. The, the data set has uh, three classes. So there are uh, data for, for these uh, three species, Cetosa, Versicolor and Virginica. And each example has four attributes, uh, the length and width of the sepal and the length and width of the petal. So this is uh, the features are uh, in four dimensions. Uh, I'm going to uh, use pandas for um, loading the tables, for doing the plotting and, and so forth. Um, I think you already used pandas in, in other courses by this time. So um, you should be comfortable with, uh, with this library. If not, then uh, take a look at, at the documentation for the visualization that we're doing here. Uh, uh, we're not going to do uh, uh, anything very sophisticated with Panda, so it's, it's going to be just some simple examples. But uh, this is a, a useful library because it simplifies uh, a lot of these tasks for loading data, for uh, manipulating the tables, and for visualization also. Uh, so one thing we can do, uh, whether we have one uh, feature or uh, many features, so if, if our data is multivariate, is to take a look at uh, the individual uh, features. If we have several of, of them, we can uh, superimpose their distributions, for example, using histograms, uh, and this uh, may allow us to compare the different distributions of values in the features. Note that this makes sense uh, especially when the features are all in the same units. So in this case, since we have all the values uh, in, in millimeters, uh, then this is, uh, they are all in the same length unit, so we can uh, compare them easily. Uh, if you had things like weight and age and height and so on, which are in different units, then you probably would have to rescale things in order to, uh, to make comparison meaningful. So we can uh, read this uh, data file. This is a, a CSV data file. We have the, um, the uh, dimensions uh, here in, in centimeters, sorry, not millimeters. And then the, the class, uh, 
to which they belong, that is the, the species of each flower in the last column. Uh, so we can uh, uh, use read CSV from Pandas, which uh, gives us a data, a data frame uh, with, uh, with the data, so basically a table. Uh, and then we can use uh, this uh, data frame object to uh, do the plot. For example, we can plot uh, a histogram like this, and we can specify the beams, the transparency, of the, the different uh, uh, plots so that we can see the a superposition of the different uh, attributes. And this allows us to compare uh, their distribution at a glance. Of course, if you have a large number of features, this uh, becomes very confusing. If you have a relatively small number, it's, uh, it's uh, easy to see the different uh, distributions. You can also separate the histogram. So note that we have this uh, uh, data plot where we specify the kind. And in this case, Pandas will give us this uh, uh, superimposed set of histograms. Or we can call the hist method that uh, gives us the histograms for each, uh, um, uh, for each series, for each column that has uh, numerical values. So this is a, a, a fairly common representation. We don't need to, to explain what, uh, what this is. Uh, uh, and you can see at a glance the distributions of the different features. One drawback of this is that it doesn't show you any correlations between the features because you cannot associate a specific combination of points or, or frequencies when uh, some feature has some value and another feature has some other value. Uh, this is also the same problem with the, the box plot, but the box plot is a more concise representation of these distributions. So uh, you can uh, create a box plot like this using the, uh, the kind box in, uh, in Pandas. And uh, this is the look of the box plot. So what we have here, is um, we have these boxes representing the 25% uh, through 75% uh, percentiles. Uh, so basically uh, quantile one to quantile three in, in the, uh, these quarters. Um, and so they represent 50% of, uh, of the data, 50% of the data of the values in each of these uh, features is inside the box. The red line represents the median. So we have uh, of, of these, uh, we can see immediately if the distribution is, uh, is very symmetrical or asymmetrical by looking at the box and the position of the median. And then we have these, uh, uh, these whiskers, the, um, these uh, uh, lines here look like some uh, some cat whiskers, they uh, indicate these values. So the the smallest value that is outside uh, the 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 uh, first quantile uh, minus the distance between the quantiles, and the maximum value that is uh, that is um, so this is inside. I mean, so minimum value that is above the first quantile minus the distance between the two. So we can, uh, if we look here at the plot, we take the first one, uh, the distance between the two multiplied by, by some value, and then we take the, the smallest one uh, that is inside here. And this will be the, the whisker uh, at this point. And then we do the same thing uh, upwards, but we take the, the, the largest one that is still below uh, this threshold. So counting uh, one uh, factor uh, multiplied by the distance between the, uh, the two quantiles. So this W is generally one or one and a half or something like that. You can, you can parameterize this, um, and, but counting from the top of the box. So this represents inside this threshold where we have the largest value that is still within uh, that range. Uh, so in this case, for example, uh, we are using 1.5 times the distance between the quantiles. So we take this, this uh, uh, distance here, 1.5 times this distance, and we take the largest value that is still inside the threshold, 
and that is the whisker. Everything that is outside that range is considered an outlier. So in this case, the whisker is actually uh, uh, closer. The, the range could go uh, quite a bit higher, but this is the maximum value in the range of, of uh, uh, this uh, feature. This is the minimum value here, and we don't have outliers. In this case, we have outliers because we have the whiskers here uh, at, the, at the edge. So counting one and a half times this difference upwards and downwards. And then we have some points that are even uh, further uh, from, uh, from the box. So uh, these are marked as outliers with uh, the circles. But, and basically this is a, a, a concise representation of the distribution of values. It's easy to see uh, asymmetries in the distribution, easy to see if it's uh, very uh, condensed or, or spread out or more or less the shape of the distribution by looking at the boxes, the whiskers and the, and the outliers. Uh, these both these cases uh, the box plot and the histograms allow us to look at distribution of individual features but they don't show any relations between features if we want to see relations between features we need to uh, do some uh, kind of plot that shows us how features vary along uh, with one another and this is an example the scatter matrix is an example of a, a set of plots that give us uh, this this idea. So basically, the scatter matrix is a, a matrix of uh, uh, plots that give us the two-dimensional projections of pairs of features. So we can, uh, for each of these plots, we are discarding everything except a pair of features. Uh, and here we can have, uh, for example, feature one with feature two is here, feature one with feature three, feature one with feature four. Of course, feature one with feature one would be just a, a, a straight line because it's the, the same value for X and, and Y. Uh, but uh, we uh, use that in the, the diagonal in this scatter plot to show uh, the distribution of the feature. This can be using kernel density estimation so uh, remember what we did with the kernel regression. We used the kernel function to uh, uh, give us the weight that each point would contribute at each uh, position along the line. Uh, with kernel density estimation, we use a kernel function, the same kind of kernel function, for example, a Gaussian function, to add the contributions of different points. So you, you can imagine that this is similar to a, a histogram, only instead of fixing a bin and counting how many points fall inside there, we add one small Gaussian curve for each point and we keep adding and adding and it gives us a smoother uh, distribution like this. So when you create a scatter matrix uh, with pandas, you, you have the option of using kernel density estimation for the diagonal, it looks like this, or you can use histograms for the diagonal. So you see uh, kernel density estimation basically gives you a, a smoother version of the, the histogram, but it's the same kind of, of representation. Outside the diagonal, we can see pairs of features and we can easily uh, note features that are correlated. For example, uh, these features here, uh, the petal length and width, they, they are strongly correlated because we can see these, uh, these distributions in the, the diagonal. So this is one way uh, to visualize when we have a, a large uh, or several features, multidimensional data, uh, visualizing the relations between different features. Another way of doing this is to use a parallel coordinates plot. So the, the idea here is that we are representing each point uh, or each uh, set of features for each example in our, in our data set not as a single point in the graph, but as a line uh, using the uh, values of the different features as coordinates in the vertical axis. So you can, you can do that with uh, these parallel coordinates in, in Pandas, and you can just, uh, um, um, for example, plot the data and use uh, some categorical um, uh, column 
uh, to separate the, the different uh, uh, categories. So in this case, we can use the name of the, um, the flower and we have this result. So each color represents a different type of flower because we, we are using the name uh, column for this. And each line here represents one flower. And we are drawing the line by joining together the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length and the petal width. So one line is one combination of these four values, which we have in one particular flower. And then another, another. So we have here as many lines as flowers. And, the, and this allows us to, uh, at a glance, note that, for example, these features seem to be very similar for all uh, flower types. But then there are variations here in the length uh, of the petal, also some variation in the width of the petal. So uh, the lines become different uh, in these features. And we, and we have an idea of how these uh, relate in the different types of, of flowers. One variant of this uh, kind of plot is the, the Andrews curves, which uh, instead of representing the lines with these uh, vertical uh, coordinates here and parallel axis for the different features represents each line as a combination of uh, sine waves with different frequencies. So uh, each feature contributes to one frequency of the, the sine wave and one different uh, trigonometrical function. So we have sines and, and cosine contributions uh, for these. And we, we have for the first feature it's just a constant, so it determines how, how high the, the line will be. But then the second feature is multiplied by the sine of these parameters, the, the, uh, the axis, the horizontal axis. The third feature is multiplied by the cosine, the fourth feature by sine with the twice the, the value of the parameter so that the frequency doubles and so on. So what this does is that uh, the different features are contributing different frequencies and different oscillations to this wave. And we can see uh, each individual point, in each individual flower in this case, as a, a, a curved uh, line with the curve changing as the features change. So we can see that there is one family here, this uh, Setosa, which is uh, different from Virginica, that is here in green, and then, uh, uh, sorry, a color in green, and then we have Virginica here in, in purple. So we can see that there are different combinations of, uh, of feature values for these categories. However, one, one disadvantage of these Andrew curves is that it's harder to intuitively understand what the contribution is of each feature, whereas for uh, parallel, uh, um, this uh, parallel coordinates plot, it's easier to see what uh, each feature is contributing uh, in the shape of, of these lines. Another way of, of representing uh, these, uh, the relations between uh, the different features is this uh, RADVIS, uh, radial visualization, which uh, distributes the different axes, the different features uh, along a circle here, and then pulls each point uh, in the direction where the, the largest value is, uh, uh, is found. So we, it's like the, the different features are pulling uh, the points with, with each with its own strength, depending on the value. And so where the points end up depends on the balance of the different forces that are pulling the points. So here we can see that uh, uh, two categories of flowers seems to be uh, quite a bit superimposed, but then there is one which uh, is uh, a bit farther from, from the rest. Um, so to do this, you just uh, implot, uh, you import the, the RADVIS and then, uh, sorry, this part is not necessary here. Uh, so then you uh, call RADVIS with your data and you can uh, give some uh, uh, column where you have the different categories so that it uh, can represent with different colors the different uh, um, uh, groups that you have. Okay, so a general problem when visualizing data in more than two dimensions is that uh, uh, 
we need some way to represent relations between the, the different features. So looking at uh, distributions isolatedly, each feature one at a time, it's easy because then we're actually only dealing with one dimension at a time. This is what we can do with, with kernel density estimation or histograms or box plots, where we get a, a notion of how one individual feature is distributed. But if we want to uh, see how uh, the features relate to one another, things get a bit more, bit more complicated. Looking at how two features are related, it's still easy because that's two dimensions and we can easily plot the things in two dimensions. But when we start uh, going into higher dimensions, uh, things become a bit harder to understand. We can use these kinds of representations, uh, parallel coordinates plots and uh, rad vis and so forth, but uh, uh, we start losing a bit uh, the ability to understand uh, the actual relations between the features, the more features we have. So uh, there is no real simple solution to this. We can handle a few dimensions probably, but when you start going into a, a very high dimensional space, uh, things get uh, uh, very difficult to understand. So next week we are going to look at uh, dimensionality reduction, how we can um, transform the data into uh, lower dimensions uh, while losing as little as possible of the, the structure uh, that we have in higher dimensions. But first we're going to uh, now today look at uh, multivariate regression. So precisely because it's harder to visualize things in more than two dimensions, so far we've been looking at uh, regression only with uh, univariate uh, data. So basically we have one value for the feature and one value for what we're trying to predict. And we saw this with polynomial curves, with kernel regression and so on, uh, because this makes it easy to plot, to understand those, uh, those trends and to see what, what is happening. Uh, but uh, in any case, if we change this to multivariate regression, that is when we are uh, receiving as input an array with more than one feature, uh, the idea is basically the same. So we, especially if we look at linear regression, this is exactly what we were uh, looking at the beginning. And uh, we ended up using, oh, since we had only one feature, we ended up uh, expanding this with uh, the square, the cube and so on. And this uh, turned out to be just polynomial uh, regression, so fitting a polynomial curve. But we can imagine that we're doing the same thing now with the different uh, coefficients, but instead of this being x and x squared and x cubed, it's different features that we're getting from our data. Uh, but this is basically the model for a linear regression. So we're trying to predict one continuous value based on a set of features that we are uh, getting uh, from our data. So let's look at, at an example. This is a, a uses data for uh, from Major League Baseball uh, uh, games uh, between in these uh, two seasons. This is from this book, Introduction to Statistical Learning and Applications, and we have this uh, CSV file. We can load it with uh, with Pandas, and we can uh, immediately call this this method uh, of the the data frame to drop. Um, uh, missing values because there are some rows which have missing values and missing values are always a, a problem so we're just going to discard those rows and what this does is reads the csv file into a data frame and then we immediately use the drop na to, dro to drop the missing values from the data frame and store this in uh, in an object. So this uh, this will be our data frame without the missing values. And this uh, head method in uh, a data frame uh, gives you a, a summary of the beginning of the table, so you can easily see uh, what what kind of uh, things you have. So we have here the name of each uh, player, of each baseball player, then the the uh, batting, number of hits, home runs, assists, and so on. And we have the salary. Uh, so uh, I think this is in thousands of, of dollars. Uh, but uh, this uh, is the, the target value that we're going to try to predict. There are also some uh, um, categorical um, columns here. 
that we're also going to, to ignore. So basically, it's, uh, basically it's, uh, league, division, new league, and so forth, uh, and the name, these are uh, four columns that we're going to drop because we, we don't need these for, for our predictions. So this is easy to do. We, uh, from our data frame, we drop, and we call the drop method to uh, drop this list of columns. And we are specifying the axis one because we're going along the columns and dropping all uh, that uh, meet these criteria. So all that have one of these names. Uh, and so in this data frame now, we don't have the name of the players and we don't have these categorical columns. We only have the numerical columns, including the salary. So we can now uh, separate this. Let's create a, a matrix X with our features. So basically this will be everything in our data frame except the salary. So we're going to drop the salary and we're going to uh, uh, store here just the NumPy matrix with the, the values. And you can do this with uh, uh, Pandas. Uh, there is an attribute called values in the, in the data frame or in the series that it's, is just the, the NumPy uh, array with the, the corresponding values. So this X matrix will be a matrix with all the features that we're going to use. And the, they are these features like the number of home runs, hits, uh, batting, assists, and so on, uh, which uh, we're going to use to try to predict the salary of the player. And then we're going to put on the Y uh, array just the values of the salary. So this is our target. Uh, this is the, the features and this is the target that we want to predict. We're also going to set aside one third of the points for testing. And for that, we're going to use uh, scikit-learn. Scikit-learn uh, has lots of, uh, of uh, um, tools for machine learning and uh, has these convenient uh, functions. For example, train test split that we can use to uh, separate our data into training and testing. So basically we use train test split. We give the, the X and the Y values here. So this is a matrix with the features and this is an array with the target values. And we specify the fraction we want on uh, the test. And this automatically shuffles and, and selects at random and generates uh, the training and testing sets with the features and the targets for training and testing. So here, if we use X train and Y train, we have the training set and then the text set, the test set uh, uh, for here, X and Y. And now we're going to uh, evaluate a linear regression model with cross-validation. So remember, we're using the training set. We are breaking it into a, a number of folds. So in this case, we're going to use five folds. And it, at each iteration, we train with four of the folds. We leave one of the folds out to measure the error. And then we do that, leaving one fold out over the, the five iterations. We've been doing that manually because uh, I wanted to show you step by step what we were doing uh, using the k-fold um, uh, uh, class from scikit-learn. But uh, we can use this uh, cross-val score from scikit-learn, which actually does this automatically. So what we do here is we create our uh, object for, with, the, with the model. So in this case, we're going to use the linear regression model. We create uh, an object for linear regression. And now we call the cross-val score, giving uh, the, the regression object that we have. So the cross-val score will automatically clone this object the number of times necessary uh, to uh, loop through all the folds. We specify here that we want five folds. So this is uh, in uh, the CV parameter there for the cross-validation number of folds, we specify five, and we specify the, the score. This is the, uh, the negative of the mean squared error. So one uh, note here is that uh, by convention, the, um, uh, the API for scikit-learn for optimizing uh, classifiers or regression models and so on, uh, maximizes the score. So this cross-val score 
will give you a score that is better when it's higher and worse when it's lower. So since we are measuring the, the mean squared error, uh, and this is an error, the error is better when it's lower and not when it's higher. So actually the score here comes as the negative of the mean squared error. This is just a convention in scikit-learn so that all the scores are to be maximized when we want the optimum value. Um, so if we want to look at this as, for example, the root mean squared error, uh, we need to take the negative of uh, the values that come here. So what this function gives us is the array with the errors for the cross-validation. So if we are using five folds, we will have five errors here because this would be uh, the error obtained using each fold as the validation set after training with the other four. Uh, so now we take the mean of these uh, errors. So this is the cross-validation error. It's the average uh, over all the folds. And uh, we uh, negate the sign because this comes as the negative of the mean squared error. And since uh, taking the negative that there, we get the mean squared error. And if we uh, compute the square root of this, we get the root mean squared error. So remember, uh, the reason for taking the root here is that um, we now have the uh, estimate of the error in the same units as we have the actual target value. So it's easy to have a more intuitive idea of what the magnitude of the error is, rather than using the unit squared, which then will give us a, a very different number. Okay, so this gives us 348. We have uh, uh, salaries around uh, 500 or 700, something like that. Some uh, are lower, uh, some are higher. So this is uh, not a very good result because we have quite a large margin of error, but maybe it's not, it's not possible to predict these uh, salaries with, with uh, uh, high precision. But we can try to, to check if we can uh, improve this. So um, one thing that may be happening is that we are overfitting. Maybe we have a lot of features, we don't have enough data, and so the model learns too much on the training set, on the little details on the training set, and then starts uh, making more mistakes outside the training set. We can check this by looking at the training error. So let's uh, create again the linear regression we're going to fit this uh, training with the complete training set and now we're going to predict the values for the training set also uh, so this would be the root mean squared error for training and we have the predictions here minus the target values in the training set squared we take the mean of that and then we uh, compute the square root. And this is 296, so it's substantially lower than uh, this one. So this tells us that our model seems to be uh, much better at predicting the values of the training data than it is of predicting, uh, in predicting values outside the training data. This means basically that we are overfitting because we have this uh, generalization error. If we were, uh, when we had this problem with uh, uh, the polynomial regression, for example, the polynomial fit, uh, we would choose a lower degree of the polynomial because that would have less flexibility. And so we could mitigate overfitting like that. However, here we are already at a linear combination of the features and unless we start throwing away some features, we cannot simplify the model anymore. So this would be, in fact, one, one possible approach. We could do feature selection. However, we're not going to look at that in this course because there are different ways of, of doing that. And usually you need to understand a bit about what the, the actual problem is to have some uh, intuition about the features. You can use some, uh, some approaches with models and with, with uh, uh, correlations and so on to try to, uh, to do feature selection. But we're only going to look briefly at that uh, further on when you look at, we look at classification, if we have time. Uh, so now we're going to take a, a, a different approach. We're going to use uh, regularization. 
So basically what we did so far is to try to pick the model that uh, predicts best outside the training set by adjusting, by comparing uh, different models. If we are overfitting, then we use a simpler model. We say use a, a polynomial degree uh, that is lower so that we don't have as much problem with overfitting. But a different approach is regularization, which uh, uh, involves not changing anything about the model, but changing how the model is trained. So changing the learning process in a way that, uh, in fact, tends to constrain uh, the model. So one example of this is ridge regression, which uses uh, uh, an L2 regularization, which is a reference to this uh, uh, square here. And uh, what we're doing is we are modifying our target, our loss function. Remember that we were minimizing the quadratic error when we were uh, fitting uh, a regression. Uh, so this is the expression here. We want to minimize the quadratic error by adjusting these parameters so that the prediction of our model is as close as possible to the actual target. But we are also now uh, giving a small penalty, so this lambda controls how much penalty we are giving, uh, to the sum of the squares of the parameters that we are computing. So basically this is the square of the size of the vector of parameters we are computing. And since this is a penalty in our loss function, what we are doing is uh, forcing the, the optimizer to deal with this trade-off between doing more or less error, but also uh, having larger or smaller parameters. So if it's possible to reduce the size of the parameters without increasing the error too much, the parameters will shrink and the magnitude of the factor of parameters will tend to be smaller. This, in, in practice, uh, constrains the, the, uh, the final hypothesis that we get, guides the training of the model so that uh, we don't have uh, uh, as much freedom to adjust to the training data. And this can help mitigate the problems of overfitting. So let's do this with the uh, uh, scikit-learn. So uh, remember that by convention, the cross val score function returns uh, the negative of the, uh, so also always returns a score that is meant to be maximized. So if we use the mean squared error, it will be the negative of the mean squared error. Uh, that's why we need this uh, minus sign here. And also uh, in scikit-learn, this uh, lambda parameter that gives us uh, how, uh, that specifies how much the um, the regularization here will weigh, will uh, impact on the loss function, uh, is called alpha in reach regression. But basically, it's, it's the same thing. So what we're going to do now is try to adjust this lambda to see if we find some sweet spot where we can minimize uh, the error outside the training set. And since we are adjusting a, a, a hyperparameter, we are going to use uh, cross-validation for that. So we uh, create here a vector, an array of uh, um, um, values for alpha. So actually, I'm going to uh, create a linear uh, uh, distribution between 0 and 15 with 100 points. But then I'm going to take the uh, uh, e raised to uh, the power of alpha. So I'm actually using an exponential um, progression here because uh, at, if you don't know where the actual value is, you may have to, to look through uh, a very large range of values. So this is one uh, practical way of doing it like that. Uh, we e see in the plot the, the logarithm of the alpha, but then we explore uh, this uh, uh, wider range. So actually the, the values that we're going to use will be this exponential uh, sequence here uh, by taking each of these uh, values in this uh, uh, linear distribution and then uh, raising e to the, the power of those values. So for each of these alphas, we're going to create this uh, ridge object. So this is, we can import from scikit-learn, and this is what allows us to do this ridge regression, which is the using this loss function that includes that 
regularization parameter. And now we're going to change the weight of the parameter. We're going to compute the, the cross-validation score for each value of alpha. And uh, we're going to store the errors here in this uh, array. So this will have the root mean square of the error uh, uh, for each different alpha. And then we can plot and uh, obtain the best alpha from the position in the errors array where we have the smallest value. This is, remember this, we, we use this several times, arg mean to find the index of the smallest value in the array. And so we raise uh, e to uh, alpha. So this is the, uh, the function for, for doing that, uh, that power. And uh, um, we obtain the best value for this alpha parameter here. Okay, so looking at the results, this is the, the plot. We can see that if we use too little regularization, uh, we don't have much improvement, but then at this point we improve a bit, the, the error reduces a bit, and then if we start to use too much regularization, we start having uh, a larger error. So uh, for this alpha of around 8,870, uh, we have the minimum there, and the root mean squared error is a bit smaller than what we had with the, um, uh, the linear regression. So linear regression uh, had this uh, 48.7, uh, and here we have 46.17. So we, we lowered a bit, we, we got uh, uh, results that were uh, not much better, but a, a bit better with regularization. Okay, so now we can train the final uh, reg regression here. Uh, remember that this uh, is an average for cross-validation, so it's, a, it's an average uh, taken of different hypotheses, uh, different uh, instances of the model training with different training sets. And now, uh, if we want to do, to actually have something that can predict these values, we need to train uh, one single instance of the model, one single hypothesis. So we can do that with a complete training set. We create a, a, a reach object with the best alpha that we find, so that we found. So this value here corresponding to this minimum of the of the root mean squared error, and uh, we train, we fit uh, our reach model with the complete uh, set of the training data. And now we can test, so we can measure the error in the test set. We uh, compute the prediction for the test set, and the error is the prediction minus the target value for the test set. So all of these squared to get the quadratic error, the mean quadratic error, and then we take the square root so that we have these, uh, these units that are more intuitive here. Uh, and we can do the same thing with linear regression. Note that at this stage, we are no longer choosing. We used the cross-validation um, error for choosing ridge regression over the linear regression because the cross-validation error is lower for uh, ridge regression than it was for uh, just linear regression without any regularization. So this was the... Uh, the reason for choosing reach regression. Now we can run, uh, we can uh, estimate the true error using the test set. The, since we chose the one with the smallest cross-validation error, the cross-validation error is no longer uh, an unbiased estimate. But we can also compare this with linear regression. So this is the test error for linear regression. Uh, and this is the... Uh, okay, I made a, a typo there. This should be a dot here, so that this would uh, would not show uh, this many um, decimal points. But uh, um, we, we can see that we have a slight improvement. So 368.6, 367. Uh, 0.6. It's a very modest improvement. There is still some improvement, but it's important to note that we are not using this for choosing. So uh, if you do this kind of thing and you find out that, uh, after all, this one had, for example, a smaller test error than this one, 
then it would be cheating to now change your mind and pick the one with the smallest test error because that would make the test error biased. So if you use this procedure of choosing the one with the smallest test error, then this would not really be a test error because uh, it will be just a, a sort of validation error uh, since you were using that one to, to choose. So this is just for comparison. We already chose uh, the read regression and uh, we can see that actually it's not a very big improvement, but there is a, a slight improvement here. So to sum up, we saw uh, today this uh, um, problem of visualizing multidimensional data. It's easy to see individual distributions, but then when you have more, uh, as you have an increasing number of dimensions, it becomes harder to uh, visualize the, the correlations between the two, uh, between the different features. And we also saw regularization. This is another way of mitigating overfitting uh, by uh, changing the way the model is trained, changing the way the model is fit. There are many different uh, examples of regularization. We only looked at read regression as one example to illustrate this approach. But uh, if you look at the uh, scikit-learn, you have lots of different uh, 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 classes for uh, reg for um, uh, regression and they have different uh, methods for regularization. So for the exercises today, I think we are, uh, uh, this is uh, getting a bit uh, um, uh, confusing because you probably still didn't do the, the last exercises because of the assignment uh, having the deadline on Tuesday. So w for us to go a bit slower now, I propose that you just uh, follow this lecture as a tutorial, try out the different plots, try the uh, uh, linear regression and the read regression, especially because in this lecture, I introduced several, uh, these two libraries and several functions and, and objects from these libraries. So probably you may want to look at the documentation of the libraries and uh, try out the code for yourself. And then we'll talk on, on Thursday, see how you are along, moving along in the exercises and we'll decide if uh, 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 you need more exercises, say over the weekend or, or for the next lecture or something like that. So see you all on, on Thursday on the, the Zoom meeting.